Um, thanks for coming back for the final plenary and then um, the wrap-up thoughts of the dialogue. Um, the final plenary is Diet for an Industrial Planet. Um, it will be with Prakash, who is Dean of College and Arts and Sciences at Tuskegee University, Jan Dutkiewicz, who is Policy Fellow at the Harvard Law School and a Research Fellow at the Swiss National Science Foundation, Tamar Haspel, who's a columnist at the Washington Post, and then finally joining us virtually, um, it will be Pam Ronald, uh, who's a professor of plant genetics at UC Davis. So please welcome the panelists to the stage. Oh, yeah. Well, Prakash, you go first, but. <laughs> Thanks, Come the other side. Hi, Pam. Hey. Hi. So, when Alex and Ted asked me to do this, I, like, I jumped at the chance because of all of the issues that have been covered here over the past couple of days, there isn't one where the theme of progress and problems gets right to the heart of it the way that it does with food. So like, in a sense, everything that's happened here has been a lead up to this panel. And, and it, it absolutely defines the fissure that, that guides the public conversation about food. We have one group that sees the problems and one group that sees the progress and never the twain shall meet. So we're going to talk about progress, we're going to talk about problems, but I want to frame it in a way that, that it, it, it's a little different from energy. Because when we talk about energy, at least we have the basic roadmap of what to do. OK, well, we have to power the grid with clean energy sources and electrify everything. And we go a long way toward solving the fossil fuel problem. But food is different because food is a pull system. People decide for themselves what they're going to eat. And farmers and food manufacturers deliver the food that people are going to buy. And there's certainly things that you can do policy-wise in those in manufacturing and in agriculture. But ultimately, changing the things that people eat is a very tall order. So instead of having this, this roadmap, OK, clean grid, electrify everything, we have these little scattershot things that we can do about food, which I think makes food a, a, a more difficult, in some ways, conversation, even though it's a relatively small slice of, of the climate pie. And so that's what we're going to talk about. And we're going to start by the panelists kicking off their work and, and their road into these issues. And we're going to start with Jan. So thank you all for uh, being here. Uh, you've had the starter. You've had the main course. I take this to be the dessert. <laughs> so thank you all for staying for dessert. Um, when Alex invited me to give this talk, he invited me to give uh, my usual spiel that I write about, which is a lefty take on meat production. But I thought it would be better to zoom out a little bit and just contextualize the conversation we're going to have. And I think it's important to start that conversation by asking what exactly we we're talking about when we talk about industrial food production. And to contextualize this, I think it's important to contextualize it in the present moment, which is a planet with 8 billion people, where almost 40% of all, all, all arable land is used for agricultural production, but also where 55% of people live in cities, with that projected to be over 70% by 2050. Globally, agriculture employs about 25% of people, which is down from over 40 uh, less than 30 years ago. In the United States, the number of people who work on farms is only 1.4%. So these are major political, economic, labor, and demographic shifts that I don't see reversing. Um, despite rising food prices, the industrial food system has provi provided tremendous bounty uh, everywhere that it exists and low prices. In the United States, despite rising food prices, uh, the average American only spends between 8 and 9 percent of their income on food, which is one of the lowest per capita expenditures in the United States, or excuse me, in the world. Um, we also produce an excess of calories and protein. So we have this amazingly abundant system. However, it's a system that also has 
tremendous problems and tremendous externalities. Uh, just to name one, uh, a recent paper in Nature Food estimates the total contribution of the entire food system, so production through consumption, at about one-third of total GHG emissions globally. So the question I think we need to ask ourselves uh, about global agriculture and our global food system, or perhaps plural global food systems is better, is how do we ensure that everyone can eat and that food production becomes more sustainable and more resilient while providing more abundance? So what does an a sort of abundance agenda for industrial food look like? So I'm going to make four quick points here uh, to set up our conversation, and I'll try to keep those to four minutes tomorrow, <laughs> as, I've been, as I've been instructed. So first off, I think for a lot of people, maybe not most people in this room, but more generally when I talk about food, and you mentioned the industrial food system, I think people conflate the entirety of the system with just the method of production. So say industrial, and people think, oh, it's monocrops, which are bad for some reason, or it's factory farms. They just sort of think of these large factories of food, and they think that's inherently bad, in large part because of the way we, we tend to romanticize food or have these sort of like bucolic, aesthetic, pastoral visions of what food production should be. But I think it's better to break down the industrial logic of food production into, into questions, right? Asking what is industrial food production? Uh, what does it produce? And why does it produce that? So thinking of industrialization in terms of principles, uses, and incentives. What do I mean by that? Well, principles are the basic principles of industrial production applied to food, right? And that means economies of scale, labor productivity and efficiency gains uh, achieved primarily through the application of technology, and standardization. So those are the principles of industrial food production. But what they're used for, meaning what they're used to produce, isn't inherent. So that system can be used to produce, I mean, as Alex said yesterday, abundant possible burgers or factory farm meat, right? Why does it produce one or the other? And the answer there lies in what I'm calling perhaps a bit awkwardly incentives, which means what determines what is produced? And are we producing simply what is most profitable, or are we thinking about other benefits like sustainability or resilience? And I think it's useful to think of industrial production, therefore, not as one set thing, but as this sort of equation where the variables can be tweaked to achieve different goals. And I think a good example of this kind of tweaking, this is my second point, comes in meat production. So uh, industrial meat production, other than being an ethical disaster in the United States alone, we kill almost 10 billion animals every single year, uh, close to 9 billion factory farm chickens, is also, so we have this disaster on our hands, uses a tremendous amount of land, highly inefficient way of producing protein. So what would an industrial solution to this look like? And I think alternative proteins, so plant-based proteins and cellular agriculture are one way that we can think about modifying industrial logics to achieve sustainability goals without sacrificing the abundance agenda. So giving consumers what they want, trying to convince them, hoping that they choose these products. So still focusing on productivity, efficiency, low cost, economies of scale, mass produced crops to deliver consumers what they want. So something I could, you might perhaps call like democratic hedonism, right? So not asking people to sacrifice, asking to embrace something delicious that has lower impacts. Third point, uh, I'm looking to you as some kind of timekeeper overlord. I'm, so, I, I'm sorry, all right. <laughs> Perfect, so I'll just, I'll sprawl like Ted did time-wise. No, I won't. So. What, what am I gonna do, get the hook? And, I, you, <laughs> you might, you might. <laughs> I might. <laughs> um, so third point, when we think about solving the problems of industrial food production, not all of them are technological. I think the other speakers will speak more to technology, but I do want to flag that there are really key questions of political economy and politics at stake that are, in a sense, divorced from the method of production, the industrial logics of production. So just to give you one example, uh, the current food price crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we have yet to really see an actual shortage. People talk about a shortage. We've yet, we have actually yet to see a major crop shortage. What we are seeing is a major crisis based on price and price is going up. Why are prices going up? They're going up because of the financialization of the food sector and commodity traders projecting a shortage in the future and therefore inflating prices to levels that they would not otherwise be at given actually available grain. 
So perhaps addressing some aspects of the looming food crisis has to do with addressing financialization or pricing rather than thinking about the model of industrial grain production in Ukraine, for instance. And finally, many problems of the food system would exist regardless of whether or not we had industrial production or non-industrial production because they rely on politics. So for instance, when we talk about food security, we know that one of the primary determinants of sufficient and consistent nutrition has nothing to do with the nature of the food system, but has everything to do with food access, which is primarily predicated on income. The more people earn, the more they eat a more abundant, more nutritious diet. But that's entirely a question of wages and of distribution than it is of how we produce the things that people eat. So I think with those four points, that would be how I'd like to queue up the rest of our conversation. Okay, well, we're gonna excuse everybody and you and I are gonna go at it. So, okay. <laughs> um, Prakash. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you very much. I, I thank the Breakthrough Institute for uh, in, inviting me to, to speak here. Uh, my perspective uh, is not much different from Jan in many ways, but I want to give a more global perspective and also provide my own personal uh, perspective as someone who grew up in India uh, at the time uh, in the 60s when India was li literally a begging bowl. We were uh, uh, starving and there was a two years of drought uh, that was uh, costing, uh, there was an impending famine. And India, as many of you know, had seen a lot of famine in this, especially in 1940s, there was a great Bengal famine. And, uh, and so Indians were used to being starved. And, uh, and it is the, the largest of American grain aid uh, that, that helped save us. I remember as a child uh, eating a strange wheat, you know, we were making roti and chapati from red wheat, but we were not used to it. It was being sent from the US. I distinctly remember the two hands from the USAID in the, in the wheat bags that we were getting at. But uh, and so at the time uh, we had uh, Norman Borlaug coming to India with a few wheat seeds. And, and in the nine, late 60s, India was producing something like 12 million tons of wheat. And today, uh, this year, India produced 110 million tons of wheat. Uh, India uh, exported $50 billion worth of agricultural products uh, last year. And uh, it is the second largest producer of wheat after China. And so much so now, because of the current Ukra Ukrainian crisis, the, India, the whole world is looking to India for uh, uh, export of uh, the wheat and India has stopped the wheat production, uh, wheat export, and that has uh, also caused some of the price surges. India is also the largest producer of milk in the world today and the number two producer of fruits and vegetables. And so it is not what you call as an industrial agriculture and yet India has managed to do a lot of that because our farms still tend to be one or two acres. And, uh, and the key uh, here is I think is innovation as to how uh, much of the surge in productivity we have seen, not just in India, but I think China is even a more remarkable example because China has less uh, arable land than India uh, and then less con and more constraints and how it could be produced in terms of how many seasons that you can plant. And yet China has managed to pull off uh, something along the lines of 400 uh, million tons of grain production. And, uh, and again, fast forward uh, from the Green Revolution of the 60s, in the last 20 years, we have seen another major transformation in agriculture that has happened because of the advent of biotechnology. Just one example is cotton in India again. Is, uh, uh, in uh, 2002, uh, India introduced a BT cotton, a genetically modified cotton that can resist uh, uh, the cotton bollworm. And uh, very soon, most 95% of Indian farmers, and we were talking about 6 million Indian farmers average about two acres. They embrace this technology and suddenly in India catapulted into becoming a number one cotton producer in the world with a substantial reduction in the amount of pesticides that was used on the, on the farm. And, and similarly, we have seen this technology spread around, uh, around the world. And so, what I look at in terms of both uh, progress and the problem is that I think in agriculture, especially in the developing world, you see a tremendous progress that we see today. And if not for that progress, the countries like India would not, a fifth largest economy in the world, 
today, it would not be what it is without the, the, the tremendous progress that we saw in agriculture that was pr again primarily driven by scientific innovation combined with meaningful policies that enabled the, the embrace of these technologies. But what we are also seeing, of course, is some of the problems with the advent of uh, that increase in agricultural productivity that was primarily the way I look at it is in terms of the, the, the ecological footprint of agriculture. Uh, it is uh, the use of uh, agrichemicals on the farm, excessive uh, uh, demands on the, the water and so much of the groundwater now is, is a major problem in India and we see that here in California too. And, uh, and also, of course, it's not related necessarily to production, but the problem is the access to food. That is a larger socio-political issue that production itself is not uh, uh, the only answer. And so moving forward, the way I look at it is, is, is what we saw in the 60s, 70s, driven by innovation with the continued reliance on science is going to be the key as we move forward for a lot of some of the wicked problems that we see facing agriculture, including continued prevalence of malnutrition, access to food, but also combined with some of the problems that we may see with the global climate change, uh, like uh, the drought, uh, flooding, and uh, increased prevalence of diseases and pests. And again here, and I, I'm looking forward to Pamela Ronald, who have watched some of the answers she's going to Will suggest because I, I do believe genetic technologies would help provide some solutions to some of the problems here, along with many tremendous scientific innovations that are happening and being embraced in farming uh, related to artificial intelligence, machine learning, robots, uh, drones, and sensors, uh, precision agriculture, the GPS, and uh, surprisingly, many of that are, are being embraced not just here in the West, but also in many of the third world farmers, just as the, the one technology like the cell phone technology that, that has democratized access to many of these innovations is also bringing it to the small farmers. So I'm quite optimistic that if we move forward in a manner in, in fostering these innovations and combined with meaningful policies and helping ensure that we guide the regulation in a way that m many of these technologies uh, would be fostered and not scuttled. And I think we, we have a, a much brighter future than what many acknowledge. Thank you. And pra Pam, Prakash gave a great lead in to you. Here you go, Pam. All right, well, hello everyone. Um, it's an honor to be here with my co-panelists and I'm looking forward to the discussion. I'm a rice geneticist at the University of California, Davis. And one of the aims of my research and others in plant and microbial biology is to make farming more productive and resilient in the face of a changing climate. Well, as you know, today, virtually everything we eat has been genetically improved in some way, and crop genetic improvement will continue to be a key component of enhancing resilience of our farms, both large and small farms. I think we're going to see that the future of our food will almost certainly include more and more crops that are genetically improved using modern biotechnologies, which includes genetic engineering, where you're taking a gene from one species and putting it into another, such as BT cotton, and genome editing. So I'd like to give you an example of a project I was fortunate to contribute to with the goal of enhancing resilience in rice. Now, I chose to study rice because it's a staple food for more than half the world's people, most rice farmers cultivate small plots of land. Rice grows well in standing water, but most varieties will die if they're submerged for more than three days. As the climate changes, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that floods will increase in duration and intensity. In South and Southeast Asia, 4 million tons of rice, enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year to flooding. And this region is home to 70 million rice farmers, many who live on less than $3 a day. A number of years ago, my colleagues and I were able to isolate a gene that confers a 60% yield advantage compared with the conventional variety when crops are flooded. Last year, 
More than 6 million farmers grew this flood tolerant rice, which we call sub one rice, submergence tolerant rice. And interesting research at Tufts and UC Berkeley has shown the benefits of the sub one technology accrued to minority social groups who are among the poorest farmers in the world. That's because these minority social groups have historically had um, the most flood prone land. And um, this has been going on for hundreds of years in India and Bangladesh. Now, these experiments were carried out with biotechnologies that were developed and applied over the last 25 years. So really kind of old technologies. So what about the future? Well, genomic discovery on a large scale is cheaper, easier, and faster than ever. In the last 15 years, we have seen dramatic advancements in genome sequencing and gene discovery. In the year 2000, the first plant genome was sequenced after seven years at a cost of $70 million. This year, the same project takes four days and costs $1,000. So not only do we have these advances in sequencing, but we have a new technology called genome editing. Now, scientists long dream about making precise changes in the genome, but this was not practical until 10 years ago when Jennifer Downey, Emmanuel Charpentier and others um, showed uh, the applications of genome editing and they were awarded the Nobel Prize for this work uh, just last year. Now, uh, geneticists around the world are now using this new technique, which is an approach to make targeted changes, targeted genetic changes. So you can pick any place in the genome and make small changes or large changes. And of course, geneticists are doing this, at least in plants, um, to enhance resistance to disease, res re resistance to pests, tolerance to environmental stress, drought, uh, hopefully, um, that Prakash mentioned. So I just wanted to give you a few examples. I um, want you to know that it's a really very exciting time for plant and microbial biology and agriculture. And I'm, I'm confident the global agricultural community will continue to make important innovations in plant genetics and breeding that will enhance the resilience of our agricultural system. Despite this tremendous scientific progress, we still have plenty of work to do. So we must not only move forward uh, with the science, we must also engage the public in the research that we do. Society will only embrace scientific advances if citizens are well informed and trust that the scientific progress is transparent and rigorous. And this is increasingly challenging because of the proliferation of misinformation that we may get into uh, during this discussion. So given the need to build a resilient and more sustainable food supply and the aggressive timeline under which this needs to happen, the ability to exploit innovative technologies is critical. And uh, I look forward to, the, to our discussion. Thanks, Pam and, and Prakash and Jan. And I want to talk about a lot of the things that, that you brought up, especially the issues of access, the issues of social buy-in, the issues of alternative protein. But it, since it's open season on literary criticism, I want to start and talk about the omnivore's dilemma. And, and because it really set up in the United States what this fight is about. And, and so I, my take on the omnivore's dilemma was that Pollan was actually right about a lot of the problems, but the only solution that he posited, which is Joel Salton, like small, diverse farms, are, are, are not solutions. But because he was wrong about the solutions, he tends, in some circles, to get poo-pooed about the things he said about the problems. And some of the problems that he brought to the fore, and he wrote this book in 2007, and so these problems had already been going on for some time. And some of the biggest ones he talks about are uh, uh, pollution, runoff, you know, loss of, of topsoil, animal welfare, and the fact that at least in the United States and increasingly in other parts of the world, we're producing two or three crops that get combined into crap food that makes people fat and sick. So since that book was written, it's been 15 years, and of course those problems had been accelerated in the period up to 2007. Have we made any progress on those major problems? 
Jan? I mean, I think that's a very broad question. So it's a very I, broad question. I don't. Question. So, no. So I mean, I don't think I, can, I, I, don't, I don't. I don't think I can give you an answer that's succinct and broad enough to address it. But I can focus, for instance, on the question of animal agriculture, which is my primary okay. area. Where, where we where we haven't de facto right. made, made progress, right? Uh, while uh, meat consumption in the United States has more or less uh, leveled off, mm -hmm. uh, we nonetheless Americans consume a tremendous amount of meat. But over 220 pounds each a year, uh, between 96 and 99 percent of that meat comes from um, factory farms, so feedlots for beef, for concentrated animal feeding operations for chickens and pork. And demand globally uh, for meat and therefore for those production systems is rising. We know that uh, demand for meat tends to track increase in GDP per capita. Mm -hmm. And so, in fact, what we're seeing is a globalization or what the geographer Tony Weiss calls the meatification of the global um, global agriculture. And I think there's sort of a wicked problem here because we know the harms that uh, animal agriculture does to animals, to waterways, to the climate, and yet the average consumer has been trained, I would say, by the industry to expect cheap and abundant meat and to center meat in their diet. And I, I'm really glad that, you, uh, that you're attacking pollen because I think I'm not attacking pollen. I'm, 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 really, I'm really glad you're critiquing pollen's <laughs> solutions that he offers to the systemic issues he identifies. Uh, Very good. <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, I think that this vision that we can reverse the meat problem by having everyone embrace free-ranging, happy, regenerative animal agriculture is a non-starter. It's a non-starter because of scale. It's a non-starter because of price. Can I ask that you yes. don't pivot to alternative protein quite yet? I'm not going to pivot to alternative okay. protein. Okay, excellent. But we need solutions at the scale of the problem. We have studies, Matthew Haig at NYU um, did a study showing that if we switched all American beef production to um, this sort of idyllic grazing production, it, this is impossible. We simply don't have enough land mass in the United States to grow that many regenerative happy cows. You can't grow nine billion chickens a year uh, who are free-ranging and frolicking and you know pecking at the grass it's simply impossible and so there ha and, and so the question becomes if i'm not allowed to pivot to alternative protein how how do we reduce consumption if it's both economically and biophysically impossible to shift the volume of meat we currently eat to more humane or sustainable practices. Okay, so I, I want to totally address those things, but basically the answer to the question of have we made progress on this front is no. Have we made progress on meat? No. On meat. We have no. not made progress on meat. And, you know, uh, Pam and Prakash, I, you know, you deal with the developing world a lot and things are different there. But are we export of the city? And a lot of them were, you know, one acre or even a half an acre, very, very small, intensively worked. And there was a woman who was very successful, and she was was a leader in her ag community, and she had a farm that was that was bigger than than many of the others. I think it was about seven acres. And she showed me what she was growing, and then she brought me in to where she had a, an apparatus for chickens laying eggs. And she said that her chickens used to run around and they, that she had nest boxes. And uh, now she has this system where each chicken is in a cage and the eggs come down the, uh, the conveyor belt and they're relatively clean and she doesn't lose any of them and it's easier for her to collect them. And and this is obviously the natural first step to you know, what we end up with in the United States, which is chickens kept in these incredibly small cages for their entire lives. And so uh, are we making efforts, are we making progress in not exporting the, the problems that we've developed here in the United States, along with our astonishingly productive food system um, in the developing world? Prakash? Yes. I, I, U.S. You know, has been a leader in the development of agri agricultural technologies and uh, whether it's improvement of high yielding crops uh, or the development of many other technologies including mechanization, 
and United States has been a leader and is one of the reasons why it is we have such a, a productive agriculture system here. And many, many other countries are, uh, are beginning to uh, incorporate many uh, the elements of high, high productive agriculture. But I believe that the, some of the problems that we saw earlier in the 70s and 80s when, uh, when this high productive agriculture was embraced in many of the developing countries, some of those problems are being addressed. Uh, see, you, you mentioned the fertilizer runoff, for mm -hmm. instance, as one. You see, one, 70 to 80 percent of the fertilizer that we apply and the farm gets gets runoff because uh, we tend to, uh, to tend to apply fertilizer in a manner that was uh, in the beginning uh, that is being addressed now with more with precision agriculture. In other words, increasingly, when the farmers have a, a better knowledge of the fertility levels of their soil. Can, can they can I, tailor the fertilizer application. And I, I get how, that, and we were just talking about this at lunch the other day because, you know, precision agriculture has been one of the marquee you know, innovations that is supposed to help. But I haven't seen evidence, at least in the U.S., and of course this is my question now, are, are mm -hmm. we exporting this? I haven't seen evidence in the U.S. that, that uh, precision agriculture has decreased pollution or runoff, and I was talking with some other people in this space, and they haven't really seen it either. Um, and and so it sounds so good, but are we really seeing progress? Oh, there has been tremendous progress in the in the application of precision agriculture because the modern farms today here in you know in Iowa and Illinois, uh, they have, we we have mapped. The, the, the element of knowledge is to, to a square foot level mm -hmm. as to how much uh, the fertility levels of the soil, the, the, and we have sensors that tell us how much uh, moisture is there in each uh, square foot of the soil and uh, uh, in terms of the pathogen and uh, the disease and the pest. And so there is a, it's very knowledge intensive farming that goes on here in the U.S. and that has translated clearly into not only the amount of uh, fertilizer but also amount of pesticides and herbicides that we use on the farm and it, it has clearly helped and that, uh, that benefit is now also being translated into many of the developing countries because in India for instance Tata Chemicals has uh, embarked on a major uh, it's a private company mm -hmm. that provides this level of service to India and it's not at the square foot level but many farmers uh, in the northern part of India for instance can buy fertilizer that is formulated specifically for and tailored mm -hmm. to their farm and and so like with any technology for instance even you know when we have uh, cell phones it was in in in, in, in the beginning beginning it was embraced mm -hmm. by people uh, by rich people but now you see uh, everyone having cell phones around the world and so i do believe so we're doing the same sort of leapfrog thing where as as agriculture intensifies the lessons that we've internalized in the united states or that we've learned are are being exported along with the technology uh, absolutely and that is what saying and as 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 you heard from Pamela Ronald, you know, her, the technology that was developed uh, about 50 miles from here in her lab in U UC Davis is now being employed by 6 million farmers uh, uh, around the world and that has made a, a transformative uh, benefit uh, in addressing the, the, one of the elements of global climate change, mm -hmm. which is the flooding. Uh, right now in India, for instance, there's a major flooding going on in the north northeastern part of India and Bangladesh, and they see this flooding every year, mm -hmm. and, and the heat and the drought. And uh, many of the research uh, that has been developed uh, around the world in the laboratories, mm -hmm. not only in the academia but also in the private sector, is being translated into uh, the products that are benefit benefiting not just the the large farmers but many of the smallholder farmers. As long as the, I think the the, big, the constraint here is not in the development of the technology, but how we make those technology available uh, through the, again the government here with the policies of many of the governments that allow this technology, and also how they are regulated. 
uh, makes a difference in how it's being commercialized and embraced. And Pam, what's your take on this? Well, um, thank you everyone for your comments. So thinking back to Rachel Carson, one of her main points is that we need to reduce indiscriminate spraying of chemical insecticides. And there has been tremendous progress since that time, and uh, not to invoke a, a dead person, but I, I hope she would be pleased with what, what we've seen. And I'm just give you one specific example uh, that Prakash brought up. So it's this BT technology, and I'll just take a minute to explain what that is. There is a, a soil organism, a bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, and it produces a toxin called BT. This has been used by organic farmers for many years. They spray it on the crops to reduce um, insect infestations, and it's very targeted and um, quite effective. The problem has been that when you spray it, there, there can be some harm to the person spraying, um, just inhaling sort of the surfactants and things, but also when you spray it, it, it doesn't actually get into the crop sometimes. So, um, the insect can, can avoid the spray. And it's very expensive and really not accessible to farmers in the less, um, less economically developed countries. So uh, 25, maybe 30 years now, scientists took the gene from the bacteria and they put it into a plant. And those crops um, are called BT crops. So these are plant crops expressing a single gene from a bacterium. And in the United States, um, there has been a tenfold reduction in chemical insecticides on corn just because of this one trait. And it's very remarkable that uh, we've been able to reduce those chemical insecticides. And I'm really glad you brought that up because I think it's one of the most powerful innovations that we have had, and it has reduced um, insecticide use here and abroad. Um, but I find that when I start to try and think of other things, I, you know, the list is, is pretty short. Do we seriously only have 16 minutes left? Because <laughs> we haven't talked about half the things we're supposed to talk about. But, um, and we want to be able to take questions, but I, I, I want to get, I, God, I want to talk about social acceptance, but I want to talk about alternative proteins. Yes. Because it's really important. Because protein is the big thing, and it's the, the, the impact that, the, the biggest impact of all of the things we eat. And so now we have a lot of alternative proteins coming onto the market. In the United States, the reception has been, I think, underwhelming in some ways. Lots of people have tried it, but there's no evidence that it's actually replacing meat in people's diets. Um, what's it gonna take before people eat the stuff instead of real meat? Yeah? Yeah, that's a great question. I think. There are a number of factors. I think the first is there was a really fantastic article about this in Vox by, by Kenny Torella one or two weeks ago, which is that alternative proteins, I mean, this modern generation of alternative proteins, so we're talking plant-based, right, right. like mm -hmm. the Beyond Burgers, Impossible Burgers, and so on, not seitan and tofu, and which have been around for millennia. But um, I think very few of them are, are great. Mm -hmm. I think a lot more uh, R&D has to go into making them really fantastic, which means either making them as analogous as possible to uh, conventional meat or, or going in new directions, but in ways that are really appealing and delicious. So that's number one. Uh, number two, we have yet to see cellular agriculture uh, reach its potential. Of course, there are many question marks about the scientific potential of cellular agriculture to scale or reach price parity, but I think that... Uh, cellular agriculture, of course, has many benefits over plant-based if it can be scaled and costs can be lowered because it massively reduces switching costs for the Those average consumer. Big ifs. So there are some really big ifs that, uh, just being conscious of time, I, we can maybe delve into them in the Q and A. I know, I know. So, so cellular agriculture hasn't happened, so I think we can't write off uh, its potential. And this is also very new technology, right? Like the first Impossible Burger was served at one restaurant in 2016, I want to say. There's people from Impossible who are fact-checking me in the audience. Um, and so I think the, this sector has gone from $0 to $1.4 billion in eight years. It's now growth has slowed, but I think it's far too early to write this off as having peaked or plateaued or as showing that there isn't uh, consumer interest. And I think just very quickly, a 
fourth issue here is the nature of the discourse about this and the amount of I want to say disinformation that might be a little bit strong which circulates in discussions about this technology I think people uh, especially people in food media people influenced by the Michael Pollan's hey. and, and the Bitmans of the world <laughs> uh, and so on uh, tend to you tend to be critical of this technology and use sh either misrepresent it or use shorthands right which is it's the product it's industrial right it's processed and so on and so forth which I think does an injustice to um, both the potential of the technology to supplant meat, but also the specifics of how it's produced, its nutritional profile, and so on. So I think turning to shorthands, like it's industrial food, it's processed food, and so on, uh, really doesn't help advance the public conversation. And I wish we could get away from that and talk about the specifics of the technology. Next year, can we do a whole panel on processed food, please? Yes. Um, but yeah, Alan Levinovitz is in. Um, <laughs> Uh, we have 12 minutes, and I would like to take questions if we can. So, questions. Uh, yes. Hi there. Whoa. Hi. That's very close. Hi. Um, I'm Saskia. I work on strategy and impact at Impossible Foods. Um, this is my first time here. Um, Welcome. Y'all probably know some of my colleagues. My question's not going to be about all proteins yet. Um, but my question is more around... How do we get more panels like this, more panels on food, in not just sessions like Breakthrough Institute, but also on the federal agenda? So one stat that I constantly think about that I want in everybody's minds here is 40% of US land is used for livestock feed production or livestock grazing. Meat is the major driver. It's also the major driver of land use. And that's a lot of land opportunity that we could be putting back for um, restoring ecosystems, for water banking, for you know, getting a lot of those environmental services that have been depleted and will be more depleted due to climate change. So that 40% is really critical. I think about it all the time. But right now, we're in an industrial system that's funneling money to commodity farms, farms that want to scale, that are growing feed crops, and that make the prices for those feed crops, for those farmers working and grazing, just cheaper and easier to access. So a lot of the issues are political and economic at a very high federal level. How do we get more of the conversations to turn to seeing food and ag as a viable carbon solution, as a viable climate solution? I, I know I'm the moderator, but I guess moderation has never been my long suit. Um, <laughs> and I would like to jump in and, and push back on that because I do write about the food system um, and I've been doing it for a very long time. and. I think that the federal policy is, the extent to which it shapes what we eat um, has been exaggerated. I think that most of what drives, you know, the fact that we're, we're grazing cattle on all of this land is that people like beef. And uh, the extent to which subsidies have, have, have change the price of the things, the feed that we feed, mostly chickens and pigs, so it's a different question from cattle. Um, most economists I talk to say that it, it's not responsible for more than 10% of the price. And if you've watched fluctuations, you talk about commodity traders, I, I'm married to one. And if the, the noise of other things that change those prices crowds out, I think, that the difference. And I'm, I'm totally with you that I want to have these conversations. But, uh, and again, I, if, if I, oh, did you just give me more time? <laughs> Do I have more time? Is that true? Yeah. It's, I have 27 minutes? You mean I went to questions prematurely? It's never premature. All right. <laughs> it's, OK, awesome. <laughs> so, um, so, all right, let's take some more questions. Hi. I have two questions for Pamela. Um, in your opening remarks, you mentioned the need for transparency with the public. I'm curious what you think the best mechanisms for increasing trust and transparency with the public are. And then my second question is more policy related. Specifically, like, is it enough for the US to just be an example on policy that enables the adoption of these technologies? Or how can we engage international partners? And like, how critical is that to get these technologies to scale? I it's was going to ask that. To get that to scale. And I wanted to follow up. So I, I gave this example of reducing chemical insecticides tenfold in the United States on corn, so one crop. 
But that technology is now available uh, many places in the world. One of the big crops is BT cotton. So in India, there's been massive reduction in insecticides, and these are small smallholder farms. China is growing BT cotton. And then one thing that's been really exciting is BT egg plant in Bangladesh. So these are very smallholder farmers, um, not much money, and they have been able to essentially eliminate applications of their chemical insecticides and have um, quite an economic benefit to, to their families. So we are already there uh, moving these technologies out. And then, of course, the sub-1 technology, as Prakash mentioned, is also um, technology developed, um, well, in, in my lab, but also at the International Rice Research Institute. So this is an international, publicly funded, foundation-funded um, research institute that's central for rice growing and collaborations with farmers growing rice all over the world. So there is a, a huge amount going on in that area. And these international centers, um, not only in the Philippines, but in Colombia, uh, in Mexico, and other countries have been essential in doing basic research and moving those discoveries to smallholder farmers in their countries. So these technologies are already at scale for, I give you the example, marker assisted breeding, which I don't need to go into the details, but it's sort of a genetic fingerprinting strategy. That's what we did with this flood tolerance. BT crops are genetically engineered. So that is another type of technology. The newest technologies is genome editing. And as far as I know, maybe Prakash can help me here. I don't think we have genome edited crops grown widely in, in countries that are uh, less economically advanced, but it's almost certain that we're, we're going to see that soon. So d does that answer your question? Can I just follow up? Because I think the social acceptance piece of this is is big and important. And you know, I'm not the only journalist who has been attacked in heinous ways because I don't <laughs> think genetic modification is is the enemy. Um, and and it uh, rejecting that kind of solution runs deep on the you know the the pollenite side of this conversation. And I don't know that I'm seeing evidence that it's changing, even though I think we're reading a little bit less about it lately. Um, how do we get people to be OK with that? And in the nuclear session, we had a whole talk about social acceptance. And, and I think it's relevant here, too. How do we change people's attitudes, or are people's attitudes changing? Anybody who has a comment on that, Prakash? Yeah, you see, uh, I'm sure Pam would agree to that. In the last 20 years, the many of the products that were developed through genetic uh, GM technology were primarily of use by the farmers, like herbicide tolerant crops right. and insect tolerant crops, and they were all, they were uh, almost all of them were brought to the market by big companies such as Monsanto, which doesn't exist anymore now, it's Bayer. And so it was easy to attack the technology as uh, the coming from big corporations and primarily, and, and consumers did not see much benefit in that, although there were tangible benefits to the environment and to the increased productivity and in many ways. But what uh, when Pamela Ronald is mentioning about gene edited crops, for instance, which doesn't involve genetic modification and it also doesn't entail uh, a very high onerous regulation uh, that which is with the GM crops. So hopefully when you see more products that are coming to the market that the consumers can relate, you know, something like a nutrition, you know, better nutrition, and less toxins and things of that nature that they can relate and it doesn't necessarily coming with a stigma of a big company and uh, it does not entail much high regulation, hopefully they would be much easily accepted by the consumer. But has the well been poisoned? Is it, is it really too late for that, at least for the time being? Do you have a sense of this, Jan? I mean, I, I think I agree with Prakash. I think it all also depends. I, I think there's, for instance, with uh, alternative proteins or more generally GM right. acceptance, there's a generational divide. I think there are people who came up 
I mean, I, I hate that he's become the antagonist on this panel. Maybe I'll pick on someone else like Alice Waters. But like, so the influence of people like Alice Waters, I think, has poisoned the well for people, for certain groups of people in certain generations. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think, broadly speaking, we see, especially with alternative proteins, that uh, younger people all over the world, not just in the United States, are showing much higher willingness to buy, much higher uh, potential willingness to buy for cellular agriculture, and much greater acceptance of biotechnology. So I think that if there's if we're talking about progress so the and boomers hope, have to die. I think, then, uh, well, I, 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 didn't say, I didn't say that. But, uh, <laughs> no, but, but, I, but, but I do think that more broadly, we do need more conversations about these topics that are in good faith. And I think, and that seek to sort of uh, do some, I mean, not even just myth busting, but just bringing the public along with what the nature of the technology is. What's the difference between genetic modification and gene editing, Okay, et totally cetera, agree et cetera, with you et cetera, here, et but let's, let's turn that whole thing on its head because there, you know, because the whole, you know, Polonite progress problems schism has defined this debate, um, and on the progress side, on the, on the problem side, there's been a reluctance to accept some of these innovations that, that Pam and Prakash have described, um, but on the progress side, I might argue that there's a reluctance to accept um, the, the niche players that aren't optimally efficient. Is there a role for these small, organic, um, pollen-esque farms in an agriculture that continues to make progress? Uh, certainly there is. You know, I, 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 I think there is there's room for all kinds of uh, uh, products here and I do believe and I know Pamela Ronald is married to an organic farmer so I'm not going to say anything to an So nobody's going to say anything bad about Rahul. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I think in a way uh, you know the organic movement uh, helped bring to light some of the you know focus light on some of the problems on modern agriculture but although the solutions they, they, they brought about was practical was probably not feasible for scaled up and I don't think the whole world can go organic. But on the other hand, what I believe is many of those uh, principles that are embraced by organic farming can be brought more to the commercial arena more easily through science and technology. I, uh, reducing I, pesticides, reducing the use of agrochemicals and uh, you know the, the overall lowering our ecological footprint of the farming can be best achieved through meaningful innovation. So, uh, so right, you take the best of each of these mm -hmm. sides, but we're a little kumbaya challenged in this space. And the two sides aren't really talking constructively to each other. Um, how do we change the tenor of the conversation because I see a lot of sneering on on both sides and and that came up in a couple of the other panels about you know when we talk about people who disagree on these issues there's a lot of Jane you ignorant slutting and and how how can we change that don't all well, answer I at think once that Obama administration made an effort, right? So there's a, a new label that's all, you know, some people think, oh my gosh, a new label, but they made an effort um, to label crops that are using, uh, for example, BT crops um, that contain a gene from a bacteria, they label it bioengineered and they have a definition associated with that. So um, there are some people think that having this additional information will um, bring this to a more science-based approach instead of simply an emotional response. And uh, we'll see. I mean, we still have a lot of misinformation from this. Uh, many of you have seen that non-GMO label, which is not anchored to really any science at all. And it's, it's put on water and salt and really confuses people. Many people think it is a, a sort of a government um, anchored label, but but it's not. So that that's problematic. Um, and then you can go back to their website, which is is full of misinformation. Um, and these this kind of misinformation, we, it's the same with vaccines, right? So we know vaccines save lives, 
Um, we know using modern biotechnology can save lives, but there will always be a very big misinformation machine going. And so we, we're always going to have to try new ways to engage the public. Um, and I think that it, the last people that will be engaged are consumers in the United States and Europe because they are, for the most part, not growing their own crops. They're not familiar with malnutrition and hunger in less developed countries. Uh, we have an array of foods we can choose from. So it, that the disconnect is that we're so removed from our farming systems, we're so removed from the plight of the subsistence farmer that only grows enough for themselves and their family. Um, so I think as, as scientists and policymakers, we have to continue to um, bring these issues uh, to the public, try to broaden the vision a little bit and also engage um, with the, the science that we do, that um, these new technologies have been used for many, many years, much longer than the new vaccines. Uh, there hasn't been a single instance of harm to human health or the environment. Um, so we, we have to just keep working at it. Let's go back to the audience. Yeah, let's, uh, questions. And, and tomorrow, let's, uh, we've got a lot of people want to get in. So let's take a kind of like three questions okay. in each round and then go back to the panel. So totally. we'll start with Guido here. Hi, my name is Guido Nunez. And uh, I have a general question for the panel that piggybacks on right what you were saying. I think we have a little bit of momentum because we spent the last two years people turning on TV. You have to listen to the experts. You have to listen to the experts. You have to listen to the experts. It became a mantra. And for vaccines, it, it was right, but now suddenly, in a very similar issue, a lot of the same people, that were foundational technologies, are not being listened to. So do you see any way of using this momentum of listen to the experts in biotech that actually gave you a vaccine, that gave you back your life? Now you should listen to them on this. And I'm not only talking about uh, the general public, I'm also talking about regulators. In Europe, the situation is just insane or in terms of what they do, but what they prevent other countries from doing. Thank you, Gita. Hi, Zachary Carabell. Uh, so this is a question for everybody, a little bit probably more about the uh, alternative protein, but it's the be careful what you wish for question. So we know from the replacement of human labor by robotics in multiple countries, supplanting a kind of industrial labor system created massive economic dislocations for lots of working class people, which is part of the whole reason for you know, the rise of populism and the anger, because while those efficiencies may have been highly welcome in multiple societies, the economic dislocations and the change in economic ecosystems was not either planned for or provided for. And I, I think there's a viable concern that if, you, if, if we rush too quickly into a solution, i.e. alternative proteins for an industrial meat system, without attending to the possibility that that will disrupt, not the possibility, the likelihood that that will disrupt economies globally, um, you're gonna create an awful lot of societal problems while solving a societal problem. And do we want one more? Hi, uh, I'm Samantha, I'm one of the research fellows here at Breakthrough. Uh, and I grew up in India, and uh, I'm yet to meet anybody in India who considers farming to be a desirable profession. So nobody wants to grow up and become a farmer, right, for obvious reasons in India. Uh, and so my sort of ignorant vision for the future of food is to make it either incredibly profitable and less labor intensive, or get people away from farming as quickly as possible, uh, especially in India. So just want to ask what sort of role do you see for some technology or a group of technologies or a set of policies that can smoothen that transition? Or you can also challenge my vision. Okay, so we have, in some ways, these are, are connected, and then Gita's question is about experts. So let's take this one first, and I have to say, I, I have an oyster farm, and I've done the back-breaking labor, and I had to stop because I just got too old. And I'm 100% with you that the back-breaking labor of subsistence farming is something that we have to get people away from, but ranching is a different kind of an element, and, and so, okay, how do we move on and both protect people's livelihoods if they want to be protected, but also move people off the farm if that's what they want and have a more sustainable food supply? Yeah. <laughs> All right. so, I mean, so I think I have a pragmatic answer and a more lefty answer, and I'll give you, I'll give you both. 
Uh, I mean, so the pragmatic answer is that it, if you're just looking at gross numbers, not all that many people uh, work in the livestock industry, right? It's a highly concentrated industry. The actual production sites are predicated on uh, sort of maximizing labor efficiency and minimizing labor. So. Uh, the anthropologist Alex Blanchett has a fantastic book called Porkopolis, which shows that any given time in a pig breeding facility raising tens of thousands of animals, you might have four or five workers total, right? In a slaughterhouse, slaughterhouses are more labor intensive. But I mean, you're not talking about that gigantic a workforce. And I think many people would not say that, you know, for eight hours a day, cutting off trotters with pneumatic shears is desirable or humane labor. So I, so I think. When it just comes to meat, if we're talking about the potential labor dislocation caused that would be caused by a generalized shift to alternative proteins, it's not that large, especially since you still need crop inputs. You would not have farms but, or slaughterhouses, but you would have production plants that still require labor. And then you plug that into an existing distribution chain, uh, existing retail, existing consumption practices, food system, food service. So I think in terms of just labor numbers, I think the dislocation would not be that large. Um, so that's the pragmatic answer. And the lefty answer is, I think that to the extent possible and to the extent that policy would allow that uh, if we're to be it, we're talking about a Green New Deal or we're talking about uh, creating a more humane economy, then I think absolutely focusing on a just transition uh, would be desirable, which would be ideally creating uh, job opportunities, ideally within alt protein for people who would be dislocated from, from those jobs. So I want to address Gita's question also because you know it comes up all the time when we talk about improving agriculture in industrialized ways. Are people just not refusing to listen to experts, or is this a case of you know bringing fact checkers to a culture war? Well, if we don't listen to the experts, look what happened in Sri Lanka. Oh, Sri Lanka! I think that is a basket case, and uh, you know, uh, uh, reporter Saloni uh, did a great job. Uh, in putting that together with Ted <laughs> in the foreign policy. I think she was one of the very first, they were one of the very first to put that uh, in, a, in, a, in the mainstream uh, media and help bring New York Times and others because it was largely being ignored. And this was a country that was agriculturally very rich. Uh, they were, uh, you know, they're getting something like $2 billion from the tea that we, uh, and, and then with uh, rice farming. And yet, uh, by based on uh, listening to non-experts, see, you know, the, the 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 president of Sri Lanka very stupidly banned importing of fertilizers and uh, pesticides. And uh, I'm not saying that was just w that was what led to the big co economic collapse of the country that we should see today. But it certainly contributed to that. And so, uh, agriculture is an increasingly sophisticated operation. And like with any other area, we do need a lot of expertise and so listening to experts is, is, is going to be increasingly important because it says such a, uh, even in India with 1.4 billion people uh, we are having labor shortage in agriculture and, uh, and so it is going to be increasingly knowledge based process and uh, one of the solution for a lot of that uh, is going to be in increasingly you know the automation and the technology how we can circumvent the back break the drudgery that is involved in farming. And many people do not understand that. Like for instance, when we say herbicide tolerant crops, immediately they jump at me, oh, you're just, oh this is herbicide, you know, it's a bad roundup, the Monsanto. But the herbicide tolerant crops have contributed to reducing the drudgery in, in so many ways, in, because uh, improve the, you know, eliminating weeds is one of the most labor intensive operation. I, in I the totally farming. agree, but in some ways I, I'm chafing at this because it feels like the conversation we could have been having ten years ago, where mm -hmm. you know advocates of of these tools present their benefits um, and sort of talk past the objections in some way. Um, and and I guess I, I'd like to think that we've moved on a little bit for, from that, and I'm a little, and I, that's not a question, so let's, let's go. <laughs> Tomorrow there will always be people that reject vaccines, I think. There will always be. We are in a major, major pandemic. We all know somebody that won't get vaccinated, right? I, I, it moves out of the realm of science, and it's the same with 
modern technologies for agriculture. It's even worse in the situation of agriculture because people are so removed from it, they don't really understand it even as much as vaccines. So I think that we have to accept that there will be some level of rejection of expertise always. And so it's, it's really we, as scientists and policymakers, we want to engage those people that are open uh, to evidence and are open to making uh, crops more resilient and advancing sustainable agriculture. Okay, but, using, but experts uh, don't... available tools that are appropriate. Experts don't always cover themselves with glory. And, <laughs> and experts disagree. And some people who set themselves up as experts aren't really that expert. And, and so I guess I'm really struggling with this idea that, that there's a cadre of people who are the people that should be listened to um, and not listening is the equivalent of, of rejecting vaccines. I, I, I don't think it's that certain. I don't well, think it's do, that. I mean, there's, there are many people that, scientists that are scientists in different fields from epidemiology that will tell you that vaccines are going to cause autism. I mean, we're mm -hmm. still gonna have groups of people that really aren't experts or maybe experts that are not going with scientific consensus. Um, so I, I mean, I think I'm in a sense agreeing with you. There is mm -hmm. going to be misinformation. There are going to be experts that don't know what they're talking about. So that's why you have to go with the body of evidence, the consensus. So a National yeah. Academy studies, they have thousands of independent scientists whose work is referenced and cited and put into volumes. And, you know, if, if we reject that kind of um, non-biased science-based information, we're not going to move forward on on any aspect uh, that we need to in the future. Okay, let's uh, go back. Yeah, so to my name is Lee Phillips. I'm a science journalist, but I also write a lot of sort of more uh, political and polemical stuff at the crossroads of science and society. And one of and I, I actually disagree a little bit with what uh, what you're saying there, um, in the sort of just acceptance that there will always be some people who just reject the experts. And I think we need a little bit more humility. Um, I wrote a piece um, at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, called, uh, entitled, uh, Tough on Anti-Vax Nonsense, Tough on the Causes of Anti-Vax Nonsense, sort of stealing from Tony Blair's famous line, tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. And I think we could say the same thing with respect to uh, GMOs um, or nuclear and, and any number of other issues uh, dear to our hearts. Tough on uh, anti-GMO nonsense, that is explain as much as we can. Tough on the causes of anti-GMO nonsense. Why is it uh, that so many people um, in society um, are rejecting the expertise or listening to people who are not experts. Um, I think there's fairly straightforward. We've lived through a generation now of experts being very confident about world-shattering uh, developments and being absolutely confident that we should just listen to them and they were wrong. The economists with respect to the uh, global financial crisis, that's not gonna happen, it can't happen anymore, and then it did with devastating consequences. The opioid epidemic. One of the reasons why people don't trust vaccines is because they've, they've seen in their lives how corporations, pharmaceutical corporations, have done some very, very bad things. And, cor and, and government has been complicit in some of that. And so uh, it's not enough for us to just explain and, ex and hope for uh, people will accept the evidence. They just don't trust experts anymore. And I think we need to be a lot more humble about that. Um, and also, just crucially, um, don't be evil. Um, people will trust well, the right. experts you know, more, the corporations more, if they don't do oh. these bad things. We need more social scientists, right? Working with scientists. I mean, scientists are developing the evidence, and um, we, but, but we need to engage people. I'm not saying that if you're an anti-vaxxer, you're a stupid person, not at all. I mean, there's reasons that you are going to distrust a vaccine, but that still does not change the fact that vaccines save lives. And how, how do we engage the public? How do we embrace the values and, um, uh, and get into communities in a way that they will have some trust? It's, it's not simple. I, I, I think that this is a really good point. And I think one of the ways that, that this can maybe happen is I, I would like to see the, the progress side 
you know, sort of step up to the overreaches of the, prog of the progress side and talk more about some of the things that Michael Pollan was actually right about. So. Hi, uh, my name is Julia Genti. I'm the policy manager at Data for Progress, and we're just sort of um, beginning our foray into the alternative protein space, and we're really interested in effective messaging surrounding alternative proteins, um, more specifically surrounding nomenclature and like what, like you know, as we're seeing like this expansive like alternative protein um, space like take place, and we're seeing like an expansion of these different technologies. Um, there's also an expansion of like different terminologies for these proteins. There's like slaughter-free meat, there's cruelty-free meat. Um, I've seen literally a million different kinds of terms. So I just want to know if you guys have done any research into like what the most effective messaging is and like what consumers are responding really well to and like maybe what kinds of messaging aren't as effective. We have one more question before we go back. Uh, one more. Oh, Hi. Uh, Steve Pastrell. I am uh, have an economics background. I had a question for Prakash, which is, you're talking about labor shortages and, and increasing productivity in, in Indian agriculture. And I've been puzzled for a while by the statistics that show like a little less than four in 10 people in the labor force in India are in agriculture. And it's about 15% of GDP. And it's actually the, the labor force participation, or the agriculture percentage going up lately. It doesn't sound like an increasing productivity system, at least labor productivity, maybe an increase in pesticide productivity. Um, is there some kind of power law going on where you're talking about some larger farms where they can't get labor, but there's all these subsistence farms? Or like, what's going on there? Because it doesn't, it's a perpetual, I mean, when you look at the development track for most countries that develop, people move off agriculture into light industry. And India famously has not had a big light industry boom. Um, is there any, how does that match up? So Prakash, if you want to take that and yeah. then we'll take the nomenclature. And okay, then yeah. we're out of time. Uh, quickly, um, uh, you know, India is a very large country and with 1.4 billion people. And so there is not a, a simple answer to that. But what, what is happening in ag Indian agriculture is, is, is there is a, it's a very messy system. There's a, the, the government policies are very intrusive and the farmers really do not have the autonomy of growing what they can grow and where they can market it. And so that has also contributed to the very low productivity. And increasingly the, the future trend is consolidation and the smaller uh, f small farmers coming together so they can go into the economies of scale in a way that we saw it in the milk movement with Amul for instance with the cooperative movement. So I, I see that as an increasing trend uh, as to, to coming together, forming cooperatives and in a, to, to, to overcome some of the problems that they have in agriculture, very short answer. All right, nomenclature, Jan, what do, what do we call this meat? Um, I, I, I think uh, very briefly, I mean, first of all, there are people doing market research. There's someone from Impossible Food sitting behind you who might have also extremely good answers or other people <laughs> in the room. Um, I think that we should just settle on functional prefixes. I think plant-based meat for plant-based meat is fine. It communicates to the consumer what it is while giving it a prefix. Uh, I think around cellular agriculture, we may well settle on cultivated meat, which is what GFI is currently proposing, which, uh, which I think is biologically sound. It's, it's fine, but I think that that's a debate we can have, that there's a non-prejudicial prefix. I think we could attach slaughter-based to conventional meat to describe the process of production that differentiates conventional meat from non-conventional, which would be only fair. Uh, and I'm, I'm not being really cheeky there, I'm being quite serious. But, um, I, but I think more broadly, there needs to be a fair access to market. So I think what's more interesting about the nomenclature issue are the challenges in states like Missouri, federal level acts like the Real Meat Act, which are being pushed by conventional meat industry uh, supporters or industry groups which seek to create prejudicial nomenclature. For instance, the Real Meat Act suggesting that plant-based or cellular meat should have the bear the prefix imitation. Of course, imitation under FDA rules suggests uh, that it's nutritionally inferior, not nutritionally equivalent. So attaching that prefix uh, legally would not only misrepresent the nature of the product, but suggest inferiority to a consumer. So I think that the, I mean, interesting in the academic sense, uh, the important battles over nomenclature will be the legal ones. For instance, in Missouri, can you call these products meat? Can you not call them meat? 
So I think, I think that matters more than whatever non-prejudicial prefixes we settle on once these products are, I mean, plant-based is already on the market, but once cellular or cultivated is on the market. So we haven't solved all the problems of the food system, but I'd like to thank the panel for giving it their best shot. Thank you. Thank you.